who, who was here last year? Yeah? And, and when we did that, we were really thankful uh, to have a representative, uh, the executive director, in fact, from the Secular Coalition for America, Larry Decker. Uh, I got to say, that is one outstanding organization. I want you to give Larry and Debbie some applause for all the work they're doing, trying to, trying to get a little bit more science in our legislation and representing secular rights. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Larry Decker. Good afternoon, California. My name is Larry Decker, and I'm the executive director of the Secular Coalition for America based in Washington, DC. It's an honor to be back with you today. Uh, I want to start first by thanking David for having me back this year, uh, and for all of you for being here. It's an incredibly important, the work that you're doing here in the state of California. Uh, your activism makes my job easier, so thank you very much. Um, let me point out Debbie Allen. Uh, Debbie is our, our new Deputy Executive Director. She's here in the front row. <laughs> Debbie joined us in April just in time for our annual Lobby Day, uh, which was a whole lot of fun in D.C., uh, and we are delighted to have her. She'll be at, under our tent all day, so please make your way over and have a conversation with her if you can. I also wanted to just give you a quick update on what's happening in D.C. Uh, it's my job to report to you honestly about what's going on, the challenges that we're facing, and how we're going to overcome them. So just over a week ago, uh, with everything happening in the news, if you can go back that far, the United States Senate confirmed Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. For many Americans, myself included, this was a day of both disgust and discouragement. It's difficult to overstate the damage Justice Kavanaugh will do to the wall of separation of church and state. His record paints a vivid and appalling portrait of a jurist who will undo decades of hard-won progress. The question is not when will Judge Kavanaugh attack our civil rights, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The question is not will Judge Kavanaugh attack our civil rights, but when. This is why we fought so hard to stop his confirmation. Our supporters sent thousands of emails and made hundreds of phone calls. On Capitol Hill, we worked with members of Congress, including the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, to shine a light on Kavanaugh's extreme and dangerous record. And until the final hours leading up to Kavanaugh's confirmation, our supporters were still calling and writing their senators. While the outcome was disappointing, uh, the struggle to stop Kavanaugh was one of the secular movement's finest moments. The religious right threw everything they had into Kavanaugh's confirmation, and they did so because they know they cannot keep winning elections. Their entire political operation exists to serve a small and shrinking segment of white, fundamentalist, evangelical Christians who want to impose their beliefs on the rest of us. Let me say this again because we need to call them out for who they are. The religious right's entire political operation exists to serve a small and shrinking segment of white fundamentalists, evangelical Christians, who want to impose their beliefs on the rest of us. The question is why? They are free to live their lives openly. We don't force them to have an abortion. We don't force them to marry someone of the same gender or reject their theism. Yet they think I'm immoral because I'm gay. Well, I think they're denying love is immoral. I think they're forcing a woman to watch an ultrasound before terminating her pregnancy is immoral. I think blocking terminally ill patients from having the choice to end their pain and suffering on their own terms is immoral. And what is most immoral about all of this is that this is a democracy where the individual has the right to self-determination not where self-determination is determined by the state. Our democracy is based on laws written by man, not God's. In our secular democracy, the Constitution prevails, not religious laws. 
and they don't like it because it means individuals can determine their own destiny. That civil liberties are protected even for, wait for it, women and gays and racial minorities and minority faiths and atheists. They know the only way to achieve their theocracy is if they stack the courts with judges who will deliver to them. But regardless of what happened last week, the United States of America is still a democracy, and I am here to tell you that our country's future will not be decided by a handful of judges, but by tens of millions of non-religious voters. And let me be clear about something to those who think that we're being too anti-Republican. Our objection to Judge Kavanaugh was based on his disdain for the constitutional principle of separation of church and state. Throughout his career, Kavanaugh has shown repeatedly that he values privileging of religion over civil liberties, that he promotes theocracy over democracy, and that his religious beliefs are elevated over his judicial obligation to fairly and impartially interpret the Constitution. I urge every secular American, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian, or Independent to recognize this fact. Our analysis of Judge Kavanaugh was on his record, not his religion, not his po uh, political affiliation, his record. And he came up short. One in four Americans identifies as non-religious, but each year we only make up 15% of the electorate. That's why the Secular Coalition for America and our member organizations have launched Secular America Votes, a nationwide get-out-the-vote effort to help increase the turnout of non-religious voters. For months, we've been organizing voter registration drives and coordinating with grassroots activists to help drive voters to the polls. Our voice is important, and in 2018, it is unacceptable to remain silent. It's a cliche to say that this is the most important election ever. But this time, it's true. For two years, the Trump administration and Congress have allowed religious zealots to set the agenda in Washington. From the Justice Department to the Department of Education, we've seen the full power of the federal government used to codify religious privilege into law. This is what it looks like when the religious right controls two branches of our government. We cannot afford to see what it looks like when they control all three, which happened last week. That's why this election is so important. That's why we have to vote in November. The courts are no longer with us. We must focus on the legislatures. Congress and state houses are the only way to protect our secular democracy until we elect a president who will reclaim some balance in the federal judiciary. Just a few days ago, the Public Religion Research Center released a poll at looking at how different groups are engaging with the midterm elections. Do you know what the highest religious group was that had uh, the highest level of political engagement? It was non-religious Democrats. According to the poll, non-religious Democrats were more than twice as likely, likely to have attended a rally than their religious peers. They were also significantly more likely to have contacted an elected official or to have donated to a candidate. Let me reiterate a point I made about our opposition to Judge Kavanaugh's promotion on the court and make that point more broadly to reflect how we determine our positions at the Secular Coalition for America. It isn't about Democrats versus Republicans, or left versus right. It's about right versus wrong. It is about fidelity to real religious freedom. For two years, the president and much of the Republican Party has helped the religious right create a two-tiered society where the religious beliefs of white evangelical Christians trump the civil rights of everyone else. With that said, is it any surprise that non-religious Democrats would be the leading uh, group carrying the charge against them? We need non-religious Republicans to join us, and non-religious Libertarians, and non-religious Green Party members, and non-religious Independents. And as importantly, we need religious Americans, 
of all political per persuasions who are as committed to the constitutional principle of real religious freedom as we are. We need them to join us too. Our secular democracy is being tested in unprecedented ways. It is up to the American people to decide whether we preserve, celebrate, and strengthen the wall of separation between church and state or continue to dismantle it. I know the fight may seem uphill, but each of us has a duty to fight nonetheless because we are the only ones who can. I'm going to close with a message to the religious right today. Celebrate in your victories trying to strip Americans of their constitutional freedom from religion. Celebrate inflicting your beliefs and your hate and intolerance on your fellow Americans. And celebrate your new puppet appointment to the Supreme Court. But now know this. Your days are numbered and your reign of terror on our Constitution will come to an end. While you think you may have God on your side, we have something better, the Constitution. The United States of America has never been a theocracy, and as long as we stand together this November, it never will be. Let's resist and take back our country. Thank you, people of reason. And now that I got that out of the way, it is a great honor for me to present today's award to a man who has shown great courage and integrity in our nation's capital. Earlier this year, four brave members of Congress came together to launch what is a game changer for the free thought community when they founded the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. The goals of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus are both inspiring and much needed in today's political climate. They are to promote public policy formed on the basis of reason, science, and moral values, to protect the secular character of our government by adhering to the strict constitutional principle of the separation of church and state, to oppose discrimination against atheists, agnostics, humanists, seekers, religious and non-religious persons, and to champion the value of freedom of thought and conscience worldwide and to provide a forum for members of Congress to discuss their moral frameworks, ethical values, and personal religious journeys. One of those founders is Congressman Jerry McNerney, who has served the people of the Valley since 2007. Congressman McNerney currently serves on the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee and the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. In April, Congressman McNerney and three of his colleagues Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, Congressman Jared Huffman of California, and Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan formed the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. The caucus now boasts 11 members and has been engaged in a number of issues, from calling on a global ban on blasphemy laws to opposing Judge Kavanaugh's appointment to the Supreme Court. I can tell you as the leader of a national organization dedicated to advocating on behalf of non-religious Americans, I cannot stress in strong enough terms how important this caucus is and how grateful we are to the congressman and his colleagues for taking the brave step to make this happen. And it is my great honor to present Congressman Jerry McNerney with this award. Please welcome Congressman Jerry McNerney. Well, it's always time for one more picture, right? <laughs> so really, I, I really appreciate this honor, uh, and I'm glad to be here this morning. It's, it's inspiring to see folks around here today that feel uh, 
the need for uh, the separation of church and state, uh, my three colleagues and I got together. Uh, we were worried in particular about the Johnson Amendment and the appropriations bill, uh, which would allow religious organizations to uh, promote uh, political candidates. And so that inspired us to get together and form the Free Thought Caucus. And since then, the feedback has been absolutely terrific. Uh, honestly, I expected uh, some negative feedback from my district, but I've got nothing but positive feedback from my community. And so I really appreciate that. I appreciate people saying how much they uh, understand the need for this. So um, you stole my fire by reading our, our uh, purpose. So I'll read it again. Is that all right? All right. Uh, the purpose of the caucus is to promote public policy formed on the basis of reason, science, and moral values. Moral values. Not, not religious values, but moral values, true boy values that apply to human beings. To protect the secular character of our government by adhering to the strict constitutional principle of the separation of church and state. And I tell you what, that drives me hard. I've seen, I've seen in our history, not in our nation's history, but in, in the history of the world, how poisonous religion can be to government. When you start imposing religious values, when you start imposing moral values on people, you end up with, you end up with the kind of situation that they had in Iran after the, uh, after the uh, revolution in 1979. I mean, you end up with people being hung and tortured and burned. I mean, this is, this is what we have to stop. To oppose discrimination against atheists, agnostics, humanists, seekers, and non-religious persons. Now, I'll tell you what. I'm not coming to you today as an atheist. I'm coming to you today as a person that cares about the human race, that cares about the direction that this country is going in. To champion the values of freedom of thought and the conscience worldwide. And you mentioned the blasphemy laws. We've seen blasphemy laws in Pakistan. We've seen blasphemy laws uh, and how corrosive and threatening they are. And lastly, and this is important, to provide a forum for members of Congress to discuss their moral frameworks, ethical values, and personal religious journeys. We meet about uh, once a quarter. Uh, we'll have a good speaker. Sometimes we'll be able to broadcast those meetings. Uh, but our intent is to make sure that people can see what we're talking about, see what is being said, uh, and see what our legislative agenda is and isn't. So I think that's very important. Now, um, another thing that we are concerned about was the, the DOJ's new form, newly formed Religious Liberty Task Force. So, that is anything but. And we've written a letter to the Department of Justice demanding answers to the questions about that uh, organization, what its goals are, who is going to be appointed to it, uh, what their timetable and meetings are. We need to know what this task force is going to be doing. Uh, and finally, as a member of Congress, as a scientist, I have a math, I'm a mathematician. Uh, I believe in science and reason-based decision-making uh, and, and science and reason-based uh, basis for, for, for creating national law. I love, I love science uh, as, as a young man. I, I, I love grad school, uh, but I tell you what, uh, you, can't base, you can't base everything on science, but you can at least uh, look at the reason and the behind decisions that are being made and decide if they're in the long-term interest of our human race. So thank you for the award. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you this morning, and um, I've got to go back and win my election. Thank you. Jerry, you make me proud to be in California District 9. Thank you. My elected official, Jerry McNerney. Thank you. And Larry, thank you also for the introduction. And thank you, Larry and Debbie, for everything that you do with the Secular Coalition for America. Back to you, Mr. MC.